Hello, Richard. Can you see me? I can indeed. Great. Yeah. Good, good. Um, right. So let's get um, let's get started then. So welcome to um, the CIJ and the first of our online uh, Logan talks in this strange new post-COVID world. And we're very grateful to have uh, Richard Norton Taylor, all the way from his home, um, a captive audience. Um, Richard Norton Taylor, for those of you uh, not familiar with his work, I imagine you are, but he's the winner of numerous awards, a uh, long, long time battler against official secrecy. Um, an intelligence official has described him as a long term thorn in the side of the intelligence establishment, which sounds like a recommendation to many journalists. He's also the author of a new book um, distributed by Bloomsbury called The State of Secrecy, Spies and the Media in Britain. So Richard, just to kick us off, um, I can see all your books in the background there. Um, but just to kick us off, maybe we could talk about the changing um, landscape of official secrecy. And I wondered in your experience as a veteran security journalist, um, given all of this um, incredibly powerful um, new technology that we're seeing and, and the thirst for transparency and freedom of information, what do you think, how do you think the landscape for official secrecy has, has changed in your experience in the last decades? Well, I suppose there is a thirst for transparency, but um, it was quite interesting because I started off over 50 years ago and, and uh, Britain was, you know, official secrecy was one of the, the, the English or British diseases, of course. And um, what was interesting is that the people who were fighting secrecy on the security intelligence services front were the officials, the head of MI, the, the people at the top of MI5, MI6, for example, and even GCHQ latterly, believe it or not, because they thought otherwise we could make, we journalists could write anything we liked about these outfits. Mm. Um, and uh, in the end, it was ministers who wanted the secrecy in the end. Now, of course, they only went so far. They, they reformed the Official Secrets Act, and it was a very modest reform towards transparency. I think now, well, I've always thought that um, what, what helped official secrecy and has traditionally helped official secrecy is the, the deference of British society, including a lot of journalists, alas, and certainly MPs. Now, I don't know whether the current crisis is, is, is helping the push towards transparency. I think gradually there has been a push for more openness. I remember writing uh, in the sort of 70s, 80s, every single expert committee of mm. scientists and so on, including committee called uh, Committee on Leprosy, um, was secret. And uh, if, if you leaked uh, those kind of, uh, or at least the, the reports from those committees, you were liable to be on the Official Secrets Act. Yeah. So um, things are moving slowly, but I have to say that I think now there's a threat, even before this virus uh, crisis, a threat of even more secrecy, which the, the current government uh, was pushing, mm. uh, with the help of the law commissioner, some independent outfit, they wanted to tighten up mm. uh, for secrecy again, i.e. going backwards, partly because they're fearful of uh, leaks and, mm. and of whistleblowers. I mean, what do you make as someone, I'm interested in the sources of an investigative journalist, and it would be easy to assume that in a world which is populated by oceans of data, that it's very, very difficult to keep a secret, just for, for lay people. Well, but then it turns out that that might not be true, and that some, quite a lot of that ocean of online data is cheap or poor quality data, and maybe we don't know the secrets any, in, in the same way that we used to know anything. No, either. They don't want us to know. I mean, is, it is it possible to get lost in the data? Well, that's what I'm going to say. Because, but two things. One is that um, I quote him in a book, a, a good uh, a British ambassador at Moscow, for example, Roderick Braithwaite, who said, secrets are like sex. We all suspect that others get more than we do. Mm. And uh, in a way, that's quite true. But there's a data, there's a, there's a, and police forces, as well as security intelligence agencies, have the same temptation. The irresistible desire to accumulate data information. Mm. Now they say, the trouble is when we fight against, uh, our, our, our fight against um, Islamists or, or potential jihadists and terrorists is, is getting increasingly difficult because it's like fighting, uh, 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 looking for a needle in a haystack. I, the, the haystack mean the more information, the more and more information they have. I say they're actually building more and more haystacks um, yeah. uh, rather than actually making it easier to find the needle, i.e. The, the really potential a uh, threat, um, individ individuals say, they can't resist uh, uh, amassing all this information, a lot of it on targets, political targets. I mean, historically, 
um, they have um, spent an inordinate amount of time, um, MI5 particularly, uh, on uh, so uh, tar targeting for what's called domestic uh, subversives, mm. um, political, you know, the minor strike, the, the um, uh, left wing groups, dissenters, and so on. And um, although, although MI5 is much better at that, because they've got other things on their plate, i.e., real, they were very slow, for example. Mm. Gathering all this data, MI5 were very slow to, to, um, to, uh, to, 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 to concentrate on, on the real threat of the IRA, for example. It was, it was very slow to um, concentrate on um, uh, the, uh, the potential jihadist Islamists. They were very slow to recognize the importance of cyber. Mm. So, so it's a question of the relevance of the data. Um, it, it, most terrorist attacks in Britain, it's just it, it's another point maybe to, to your question, most of terrorist attacks uh, occurring in Britain or in, throughout the West, actually, in the last 10 years or so, uh, the, the, uh, the perpetrators have been known to the, uh, security na uh, the national security intelligence agencies. Hmm. Um, now, that shows that they had some information, but didn't know how to. I know it's very difficult. They didn't know. Didn't have, they, they didn't see the wood from the trees, perhaps. Hmm. Or, uh, they were busy gathering so much data, uh, which is so easy to do now, of course, hmm. that... Um, with, 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 with massive computers that, that, that they can't uh, uh, and uh, uh, see the, uh, the real targets. I mean, presumably in common with many journalists, you would say that there are good reasons that some things should remain secret, even when it comes to national security. You talk, I think, about the fetish for, for, for official secrecy. You know, the, in other words, the bar has to be um, something about malfeasance um, or defeat. Um, the, Yes, I mean, I was in, in the Guardian. I remember discussing things, and um, I, w with the editors uh, over the years, saying the one thing I would self censor myself with um, w was naming, say, and uh, if you know an operation that would SASA or MI6 were doing in some country, and naming those people involved. Yes, you can talk about it and write about it afterwards, maybe. But if if you really are um, threatening, and you're convinced that you are threatening someone's life. Mm. An individual's life, and then you 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 indulge as you were, or you you participate in a kind of self censorship. But um, the, the, there are very few mm. items of information, very few classes of information, which uh, would would cover if they were leaked, would threaten genuine national security. Um, mm. That's what I um, that's what I say. You think it's true to say that in a in what what you might call a victim culture, it's it's easier to rely not on national security, but on an argument which always says there is the potential here for someone to be hurt. Yeah, and, you know. yeah, you've got to, I mean, in, in that sense, you've got to, you know, you've got to make your own judgment. You've got to be, quote, responsible, unquote, writing about the sensitive issue of security intelligence. Um, that the, um, they will always say, and, and they say now, potentially in the future, that information, as I say about data, data mining too, now, that information may be apparently innocent now, but we've got to keep that record and keep that mountain of the mountains of documents. Um, mm. um, because one day, um, one plus one may equal two, and, and we find another bit of information which relates to the first bit of information. Now, that, that's the argument. Um, I think it, there's no evidence, or there's very little evidence, that mm. that uh, argument has, uh, holds water on this. I mean, let's talk a little bit about the culture of spying, which you know a bit about. Um, um, I gather from the first pages of your book that you got the tap on the shoulder yourself from MI6 when just after you, you left Oxford. I'm just, I'm just reading the biography of John le Carre, which you might have read, the Adam Sisman biography, and it, yeah. it tells a powerful story about what spying was like in the 1960s. And I wonder if you can say anything about the changing personnel, the changing culture, even the changing yeah. MO of, of spying in Britain. Well, there's been a dramatic change of... Um of personnel and recruitment and for a very very long time as I think two of the um, I think that the big reformers who are quite good in, uh, in MI5 in the 90s and uh, the noughties were, were, were two women Stella Rimmington and then Eliza Manning and Buller who reformed uh, um, MI5 shook it up shook the culture up it was for a long long time full of old uh, semi-retired colonels and and, 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 and and police inspectors and so on um, and the culture was a very beery culture. Anyone who's read Peter Wright's Spy Catcher, uh, a drinking culture, I say, uh, more than beer, actually, whiskey in Bourbon in Peter Wright's case. But um, yeah. so, and, and, and only now 
or fairly recently, maybe uh, MI5 or MI6, um, wanted uh, people, and they now proudly say there are more women, more uh, people from ethnic minorities, uh, and um, recruits. Um, MI6 uh, were very, this white, there was a white male outfit, sort of, MI6 looked down on MI5, who looked, looked down on special branch, looked down on the cop in the street, and there's all that. But, um, but I, they are saying that because, because they, they need relevant people with relevant skills. GCHQ, the most secretive of all the agencies, sure. um, re recently not only appealing for, um, for um, uh, hackers, they, they, they want from a hackers, they want to actually recruit teenagers who yeah. are that they're very good at hacking, so they can um, recruit them for uh, for uh, their uh, their cyber um, cyber defenses and, and and for cyber warfare and so on. So I mean, they have changed, but very very um, pretty well pretty recently. And GCS is pretty recently, and, and and post Snowden case, for example, where a lot of um, it was quite funny during the Snowden. Um, Row in the sort of early uh, 2013, 14, and so on. The um, the uh, MI5 and MI6 says, "Well, that's that's the that's GCHQ's fault for being so secretive," which is it's a bit rich coming from five and six who are beginning to open up, but um, not as much as GCHQ then. But now the culture has changed, and they're desperate for recruits. Yeah, yeah, with, so with relevant skills. So it's possible in the same way that British intelligence is rather famed now for having conversations with jihadis where they all the time try and turn them, that if you're a hacker facing a couple of years, that you might have an interesting conversation with somebody in MI5 where they suggest that you work for them instead. Yeah, exactly. Absolutely. And right. um, I, I don't remember the case of Gareth Williams, who was a, a, a brilliant guy, actually, but a um, slightly strange person who was found dead in an empty bag in his... Oh, in Pimlico. Flat, remember, yeah. a few years ago. He, he was a uh, worked for MI6, a second to MI6, but he was a GCHQ wizard on computer stuff. Because the other thing, of course, MI5 and 6 and have been hoping very slow on computer skills, or the whole of Whitehall has, as we know from NHS and everything else. They're very, very bad at information technology. Um, mm. Now they're getting better. Um, anyway, yeah, that's, um, that's, yeah. The, that's the reforms that, that, that is happening about time, too, I'd say. Let's, let's talk a little bit about the the changing landscape then for journalism, about, um, investigative journalists, and whether the do you think that the, the truth seeking profession that you you grew up in, people like yourself and Duncan Campbell, given the disemboweling of newspaper economics, do you think that exists in the same way that it once did or could do, or do you think everything is now different and and, and if so how? Well, it, it has all been a struggle because um, I mean news editors and most editors too, I think traditionally have been not been terribly interested in stories about uh, what, well about what what naughty things maybe or bad things about scandals and security intelligence services they don't mind sort of uh, spying scandals uh, um, in, involving double agents and so on of course they're, they're sort of attractive stories to write but um, traditionally they haven't been very interested in, these, in digging at the corruption of, of, of government and uh, partly because I think the, the deferential culture now more recently, of course, that there's been a, uh, they've been obsessed by 24/7, 24/7, and of course social media and so on. Mm. Uh, so the the limited uh, the low boredom threshold, I think, of some news desks, a lot of news desks, have been um, of getting um, lower and lower. So you get some sort of butterfly-minded people saying, "Ah, oh, we um, we that's a long that's a story which is not, not, not meaning and not an end and it's going to go on for ages so let's forget about it and that goes even for um, important uh, court trials actually you, mm. you don't, people don't understand what a often because they're not allowed to know what a public a big a long public inquiry or a, a, a court case is, is happening even though it's very important maybe the first day you get a report and then the last day but people people don't know what it's about, they forget what it's about. It's the kind of attention span, really. And then mm -hmm. the digging now, of course, there is a kind of, is there a backlash, this sort of backlash? You talk about, uh, people talk about slow journalism now, don't they? You know, mm -hmm. this thing called tortoise has been set up. Um, so maybe there are people are gonna uh, go for more, the audience out there is for, it's for more serious, uh, um, mm -hmm. slow journalism, or a lot long, I mean, I wonder, is there something about the, you know, the economics, the dwindling economics of the profession that means that there is less appetite for risk, for lawyering, for the kind of hard work? That, that yes, that, yes, there is. Yes, there is. I mean, there was, there were, I mean, most uh, newspaper lawyers were, were pretty cautious anyway. Um, mm. 
on talking about the, the, the kind of stories we're, we're talking about now. Um, and of course, yeah, the, 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 um, cost, cost money, cost money. People are very much even more cautious generally than they used to be. Absolutely, yeah. Mm. But, but for economic reasons as well as the, the broad sort of political culture, yeah. Yeah. There's also a thing about newspapers in general that they sort of need to butter up um, the security services to some extent because they want the stories too. So if you make yourself an enemy of the security services, well, that might not be good for business. I, I always said, and that's a, that's a that's a key point really, is that they, I've always said that they, and also on the of my journalistic colleagues, not the minority, I think, would, would say that, they need us more than we need them. And I think that they realize that because, you say that, but why exactly do they need us more than... Because um, they want to know, that they want now anyway, and for, and for some years now, if you're writing about them, then they want to write as accurate stuff as, as you can about them. Otherwise, you, and, and um, if, if they say mum all the time, you make things up, you make things up, they may look bad if you make mm. things up, but there's no, they can't say, and then we'll say we make something up, which is a wrong story, say, uh, inaccurate story, but they're in a bad light. Um, then they, um, then they, and they say, well, well, we say it's not our fault. You didn't say what was right and which was not, which is not right. Now, of course, that um, works. I mean, they don't volunteer information. Mm. So you've got to, you've got to know yourself. But partly relying maybe on your um, sources from other countries, from more open countries, a whistleblower, uh, a source which is. Um, um, which is sort of uh, concerned, a conscientious source who tells you privately, got to trust you, trusts you as a journalist, and then you have got to know the, what questions to ask. And the more questions to ask, and of course, the more um, that the uh, security intelligence service is going to be on the defensive. Um, but they have a tremendous ability still to uh, dissemble and to deny things, and um, we're going off off, the, off your point now in a way about. Oh, no. um, uh, um, well, they say neither confirm nor deny, NCDC, neither confirm nor deny, mm. um, which is a great thing uh, that they say. And, that this, uh, and, and they, they, they don't talk about direct lies, but they, they, but most people, you see, most journalists, I think, traditionally, in my experience anyway, if you write about these exotic agencies, you know, security intelligence agencies, spying, counter spying, all that stuff, mm. um, they put on the kind of pedestal, really. And um, they um, and 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 they're very to be attracted and seduced by them, and I think uh, that's happened generally too much. I mean, historically, in my experience, and it's certainly that attitude of, of deference, if you like, uh, is reflected by most MPs as well. And, and um, you know, the, the so-called the Intelligence Security Committee of, of peers and. Um, uh, I wonder. And, it's sort of just to go back to your previous answer. You know. Yeah about how much they need us. Maybe they don't need us so much because there's this um, massive ocean of new media out there and social media, and much of it is populated by, by conspiracy theorists. Yeah. Um, and I wonder whether the security services prefer to deal with journalists or they prefer to deal with um, all of the stuff out there on, 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 on social media, which occasionally can get it right, but which very often um, yeah. gets it wrong as well. No, I think that, I think they, they want to avoid responding to social media stories, um, um, whether they're half accurate or totally accurate or just conspiracy theories. I mean, I'll, I'll put it about. They have, you know, they have their known sources and their trusted sources, of which I suppose I was one at one point, in the sense that, not, not, not the same as other people, but if there's, well, it's, it's a question of credibility, really. If, if someone who I trusted, say from MI5 or MI6, mm. would say, um, uh, or I asked them, what about this story going on social media? Hmm. Um, and they would, uh, they would say, well, I, I wouldn't, you know, in some kind of euphemistic way, I wouldn't pursue that if I were you. Blah, blah, blah. Now, if, if, they, if uh, that was a great story and they, did, they implied to me that, they, that it wasn't, hmm. and it turned out to be a very good story, um, I would be pretty annoyed, pissed off. Hmm. And, they would, and they wouldn't trust, and you wouldn't trust them anymore. And they yeah. wanted to keep that trust, you see. Now, um, conspiracy theories, they don't like conspiracy theories. They'll put it about that um, this conspiracy theory is all is a conspiracy full stop. 
um, they will then nod and a wink will say this other story is actually or social media or whatever it is um, is worth pursuing or but I wonder because the essence of some kinds of conspiracy theory it would imply that all these intelligence agencies are extremely efficient and that they control the strings behind everything that happens in the world yeah. whereas it seems to me a much more devastating kind of reporting would show incompetence rather than yeah exactly conspiracy yeah. No, that's absolutely right and um they uh, maybe you could argue that the security intelligence they just have an interest in in um, in flagging up conspiracy theories because they, they confuse the issue. They say, "Oh, this is all a conspiracy. This is all a conspiracy." There's so many conspiracies around. Yes. Meanwhile, behind the scenes, really, you know, serious scandals or corruption or um, which, cover ups is go are going on. Which brings me to one of your stories. I thought I'd pick one because there's such a banquet of riches in your work. But I, I thought I'd um, have you talk a little bit about the. The Mull of Kintyre story, which may not be familiar to some people, but it was an interesting episode because in 1994, um, as, as, as some of us um, will know, all, all these Northern Ireland, Northern Irish intelligence officers were killed yeah. on a Chinook helicopter. Yeah. And you spent years trying to get at the truth of what had happened. And initially, the MOD, I think, had said that this was incompetence um, of the pilots. Um, and later, it turned out to have been. Um, engine failure and at the time you were considered to be a conspiracy theorist because you were scratching away and kept scratching what do you make of that story now well i thought it was an example of of uh, minister of defense um dissembling not wanting to tell the truth because of their own uh well a scandal of, of trying to cover up uh problems they they knew that that chinook helicopter that version of the chinook helicopter had um but they um they 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 wanted to cover that up and they said no, it was pilot to negligence, and mm -hmm. it was only I think uh, seven. That was 1994. Now 2011, I think 17 years later. How many years is that? Yeah, 17. That um, that uh, the the, um, the 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 truth came out in the sense that uh, the, uh, be because of the, the the lack of evidence against uh, against the pilots and the incriminating evidence by test pilots and other people about how that particular version of the Chinook helicopter was um, uh, was, was malfunctioning, had, had a bad safety record, technically. The software was wrong, et cetera, et cetera. Now, the other reason the MOD wanted to cover that up was because of the, the error of putting every single senior security intelligence officer, MI5, uh, the RUC as it then was, anyway, the, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and so on, from uh, in the same aircraft. Mm. Which is against you know all the protocol of most um, at the time I think, mm. and and they ac acute embarrassment they blame the pilots that they, they were very highly trained pilots trained to um, carry special forces uh, on operations um, in, in Chinook helicopters. So during during all that scratching away, were you getting um, some of your sources in the MOD saying, "Oh, there's nothing in it. You know, go away. There's nothing here." That that was difficult. Yes, I mean Jeff Hoon, who's said I was very irritated who was then a defense secretary people may remember Jeff Hoon one of my one of my one of my people who I um let's where are they now? Who I, I, I'm, uh, anyway uh, um who was a defense uh, secretary during the um, invasion of Iraq too of course yeah. um I'm very irritated by this so I, I, I tell you um two um former air marshals uh, basically came vicious attacks on me for for questioning their their judgment and I think one of them at least was on the, the board, which, which found these pilots um, guilty of negligence, gross negligence. Um, but it was other, but well, you've got to have tenacity really, you've got to have a certain character, I suppose, to pursue these things and keep going at them. Um, and, and, uh, and patience. And finally, um, the, 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 the judge inquiry. Now, um, I was helped, of course, by certain uh, RAF test pilots and other people in the RAF and former RAF people um, who um, who uh, encouraged me, and that's what that's what also what happens, and it's happened in other stories too. When, for example, um, MI5 and MI6 deny they had any collusion with CIA operations leading to the torture of of um, you know the one of famous case uh, of two of two Libyans, uh, particularly who, were, uh, but also other people sent to British people sent to Guantanamo Bay. Um, they um, they they basically covered up. You've got to have persistence in um, in pursuing these things and eventually I was encouraged by well I rely quite a lot on people subversives I suppose the government would call them officials in different Whitehall departments mm. 
as well, and not strictly speaking whistleblowers and things. Uh, well, no, they wouldn't be sort of whistleblowers like um, certainly wouldn't name themselves, and whistleblowers who who see something specifically like a corrupt um, uh, uh, event or, or problem involving money, say, or whistleblowers in hospitals now, uh, recently in the NHS. Um, they're, they're, they're a kind of a, a smoother kind of whistleblower who will say, "Carry on, Richard. I can't tell you any specific facts, but." Um, Go digging, go digging. You know that's that's the kind of thing, which helps you. Which do you prefer, working with archives or whistleblowers? Well, whistleblowers, I think, human beings. Well, archives is easier, really, because they are there, and of course, they, they come out. And intelligence, security. Uh, um, well, MI five archives come out in a rather haphazard way. Good mm. stories, easy good stories, which MI five. Curse enough, admit, um, but because I suppose they, they quite like publicity about MI5, um, even though they 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 show that they've been targeting all sorts of people who they thought at one point was a communist in the Cold War, and authors and writers and Doris Lessing or people like that, authors like that, and and, and hundreds of people. Um, but the but MI5 don't mind. They they well, they don't mind. They they have to release the records at some point. But they of course they decided in their own time. And they, they and they can uh, censor things. I mean, that's another thing about records. Actually, the frustrating things, as you mentioned, records. The National Archives have this are covered by the Public Records Act, mm. which give Whitehall departments, and that means the spooks too, of course, um, uh, absolute uh, freedom to retain yeah. documents that they want to. And they say, for whatever reason, we we can retain these documents, even though they're they're due to let's say. 30, 30 year rule, which is now being uh, cut down to about 20 years eventually. So it is, frust it is quite easy to, 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 um, to write about the records when they're released, because they're released, or, or, find, or dig into them, because you, you find out someone's given you a nod and a wink. Mm. Um, for example, someone will tell you that uh, there's a good archive there which shows you that the British claims on the sovereignty of Gibraltar or Falklands actually is not as great as they claim. That, that's a good story. And, and then you can read it in black and white on an, 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 an old typewritten document somewhere. But of course, the other thing about, about, uh, about archives is that from now on, they're going to be um, electronic archives or uh, they're going to be post-its and things like that. People, that very, very much less, the danger anyway, is that there's going to be much less on paper uh, for, for future historians or journalists who look back on past scandals because they'll be, they'll be covered up by some keyboard stroke which gets rid of all the email uh, evidence or post-its are screwed up and so on, that you wouldn't have as much um, written down on hard copy. How, how, how has the culture of whistleblowing changed or your um, ability to deal with whistleblowers changed, do you think? Well, I think that there are probably more and more whistleblowers and that's why the government wants to tighten up the Federal Secrets Act. Mm. Um, partly, well, Two reasons, if I could say it quickly on that, because which is which is rather sort of forgotten about in the Queen's speech in November last, the new government said that they're going to introduce a new Espionage Act. Oh yes, there's going to be a new uh, act on um, on environmental secrecy, I think, and uh, and also um, the, the the plan by the Law Commission, accepted by the government, which will actually make it uh, tighten up the the number of information, the amount of information, the kind of information. Um, the class of information which, which you now can release under the Freedom of Asian Act, mm. and you will be stopped from doing that if the government gets its way, because the government is particularly concerned, you asked about whistleblowers, it is getting increasingly concerned about whistleblowers. And there are more whistleblowers, we've seen, say, in the NHS, say, um, and um, in the current crisis from these different committees, and uh, I think there will be more, um, because of well, partly because of the erosion of the culture of deference, say, that more and more things can go wrong, and, and that's what worries the government, yeah. Okay, um, let's have a look at some of these questions coming in. Quite a few of these questions are about, um, um, oh, a couple of, about the, uh, your time at The Guardian, um, Julian Assange. What do you make of the Julian Assange case? It's such a big subject that um, it's hard to talk about. And you've been at The Guardian, which had a, a love affair with Julian Assange and WikiLeaks followed by a very messy public divorce. Um, do you want to say anything about um, your reflections on that or even, and there's a more factual question here that I think maybe you address in the book, which is that 
it may well be the case that if Assange is extradited to America, that the American government are in a position that they have to prove harm that was caused by, by, by his revelation. So harm to informants in Afghanistan, for example. Do you think they'll be capable of proving um, any harm as a result of those leaks? Or do you think it's a black? I think it'd be very, very difficult. Although I, I think, you know, I, I, just because that is difficult, is not a reason to extradite him. And I think you know, there are other pressures the Americans put under their own Espionage Act. But um, I mean, there were there's a dispute between, well, I think people know that, between the, the Guardian and Assange. But on the point, uh, on, on, on the point you raised, yeah, there's a, there's, there's for example, the, um, one of the first lot of, uh, of documents that um, Assange released, Wiki, WikiLeaks, leaked with, with the Guardian's help were to do with the operations in Iraq and uh, Afghanistan. Mm. Um, and um, they little called terrible harm and all this, that and the other claimed the Americans. See, I, now, afterwards, or, or some, a bit of time afterwards, uh, senior American officials, including uh, uh, Bill Gates, who is a former CIA director, was asked, uh, what harm has this done to America's uh, national security or uh, diplomacy and so on and they said no it no harm no harm no harm mm. so um now the, the argument about uh, and the argument came afterwards with the guardian because you know there, there was he wanted um, us to print something immediately without checking without kind of a bit of looking around you know a bit of censoring sensitive information here and there he he didn't want that he then uh, published uh, this um, this information, although actually it didn't get much traction. Um, it, it allowed, though, the Americans to say, "Ah, he's, he's claiming that his uh, that Assange has um, released uh, passwords and Pentagon passwords and all that," which I think when you get grossly exaggerated. Uh, and uh, the, 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 the then, especially from the Guardian's point of view, um, issue of Assange became complicated because he um, was um, accused of, of of rape in Sweden. Mm. And now, of course, that case was um, been adorned, I understand, from the, by the Swedish um, victim or Swedish prosecutors, anyway. Although it's unclear. So, uh, but then it became an issue between well, Julian Assange and America and, and freedom of the press on the one hand, and Julian Assange as an individual, and charged with or at least accused of indulging in rape. So it became a very complicated thing. Assange is, is I mean, you know. He, he has not been written about very much in The Guardian recently, I don't think, in spite of his, well, here and there he has. He's not, people, people in Britain, I don't think, generally in the British press, have actually uh, come to his, come to the aid of someone who's in such a mess, but psychologically, personally, and everything else, as well as, the, as being the, the, at the end of, um, of, 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 of attacks and claims by the US that he was, um, threatening American national security. Why do you think they haven't come to his defense then so much? Well, I, I think maybe they are a bit more now. Now, is it, you know, in, in, in Belmarsh and is um, pretty um, um, ill, apparently, and uh, so on. I think because, because I think his own personal character, I suppose. Mm. Um, uh, that was, you know, earlier on. Mm. And then I suppose he was embarrassed. He, he embarrassed the newspapers, including the Guardian, up to a point. Um, and um, the, and he was he was basically for a long time, although you know, in, interest in his story um, uh, came up again in the last um, time. Um, but he was he was just um, effectively ignored, I suppose. But that was during your time at the Guardian. But that was not part. You you were never involved in those revelations at all. And I wonder. Uh, I wonder what your sources would have made of all of that, or that sort of passed you by all of the the WikiLeaks stuff at the Guardian. I was involved like... in some of the early WikiLeaks stuff, and, oh. and and enjoyed writing about all this stuff. And and I mean, one particular damning episode was how the American helicopters killed a Reuters, you remember, in the Iraq. Oh, yeah. uh, uh, you know, journalists. Um, yes. And um, you know, it was it was uh, there were good stories, and and. Uh, he had a, and, and it, he was persuaded by a couple of um, Guardian journalists at the time to uh, reveal them or, or, or pass them on to the Guardian more than anyone else. And that was a great story. Uh, but then he wanted more and more to come out. He wanted us to, like other people have in the past, other um, 
uh, contacts and, and lawyers have to me. They said, um, the Guardian must publish this lot, this new lot of information as well and claims and so on, just like that, without having been able to look at them and, <laughs> and edit them and, and, and this and the other, edit them for good reasons. So that is, that is why, uh, and I think it's left, it's left a bit of a bad taste amongst a lot of people how Assange was dumped by, by, um, by, by the British media and the, the sort of liberal media in general, in yeah. particular, I should say. And another question, how often did lawyers sit in on conversations with editors about a story? Uh, how? How often did lawyers sit in on conversations with editors about a story? I mean, well, yeah. They, I mean, if you've got more confidence about writing stories, because you know your raw experience, you know your sources and this that, and the other, and, and you've got to say a track record and talk about me talking about all sorts of people who've been around for a bit of time, then you, you develop a relationship with uh, the libel lawyers mm. um, on the paper and, um, and, and, and the editor would trust, the, 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 especially the in-house lawyers, as well as the, the reporter writing the story. Um, I think in, in my experience, there'll be a fewer and fewer. I mean, you've got to be, you, you've got to, on the libel front, it's, the it's against the individual that matters rather than, of course you can't, I mean, you can say what you like about um, different departments and Ministry of Defense, which I have, for example, and they're not gonna, they're not gonna sue you. Um, so it's the individual that matters. You've got to be quite careful, um, but, um, a lot of things are done in-house before, very few cases now, libel cases, I think now come to court. They've been to a spectacular case, of course, like hacking um, um, the news of the world, all that, but um, covering security intelligence stories is less likely to because the other side, IMI5, MI6, GCSQ, do not want the, um, the, uh, the, the extra publicity, the, 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 that a libel case or a court case will mm. evoke. Um, so th the answer is not many stories, in my experience, when you're writing about security intelligence agencies, get to uh, get, you know, become a, a, yeah. a, a libel case, yeah. Is there, is there a distinction, you know much more about this than me, but is there a distinction between sort of offensive use of a lawyer and defensive in the sense that, um, a lawyer can, you know, wander into your office um, looking, uh, you know, anxious about a story that you might be writing, or a lawyer can help you to try and uncover information by being, by using tools within legal activism to try and push for more information. Is that a useful distinction? And if, if it is, then how has that changed the balance? Well, the same thing, an, an in-house a, a newspapers uh, or, or a, a broadcasting outfits, um, uh, uh, the, the, a media in-house lawyer, where well, most are going to be a cautious on the defensive. Hmm. If you're talking about a, a, a lawyer outside, if you've got your own um, more radical lawyer, for sake of argument, encourage, encouraging a journalist to go for it. Um, is that what you mean? I mean, then you can tell the, uh, you can tell the editor, according to this lawyer who I know, who knows this area very well, that safe to write X, Y, and Z. But in the end, it'll still be the in-house lawyer, the libel lawyer of, of, of that media organization who will, will, have the, um, will have the influence and have the influence over the editor. But editors, you know, are different too. Um, I mean, Alan Rushbridge, who wrote the Snowden, who, who wrote the Snowden stuff, but um, promoted the Snowden stuff and got it printed in The Guardian, um, uh, was a different kind of person to other editors, you know. And, mm -hmm. uh, and, and lawyers knew that and lawyers, uh, wouldn't have an influence on that kind of story, actually. Because it's not a risk, it's really, you know, it's a cracking story. And mm -hmm. who, who's going to take the Guardian to court on a libel thing? Well, uh, Official Secrets Act is a possibility, of course, but then that's a political decision, creates waves with the government, even the you know, conservative government say want to take people to the Official Secrets Act prosecution to provoke even more um, unwelcome publicity, attacks on the government for suppressing the you know media and all that. I mean, is there a soft version of that that, that, that editors should be wary of where um, a senior figure in an intelligence agency might say, well, you don't want to publish this, but instead we'll give you this. Does that, does that still happen? 
I think it probably happens here and there. Um, it does happen. It happens actually in the Ministry of Defence, particularly. Uh, but, but the Ministry of Defence is past master at saying to the son, look, let, let's say this is an argument. I have no evidence that this happens. Or, um, here's, a here's a tabloid, let's say the son. Um, they get hold of a story and say, look, um, why don't you sort of uh, suppress this story because another one which you'll love. Um, uh, that may happen. What happened to, and, and, and equally to the Telegraph, the Guardian, uh, you got a story that I, we'll give you this other story instead. I think that happens, but um, more often really is what happens is when you, you phone out the press officer mm. to get a response, that I've got this story. Mm. They'll, they'll say, and they say more aggressively, white old department, say, well, what are you writing? What are you going to write about? When are you going to write about it? When you ask a question about, did the minister say that? or what, what was spent on this, or is it, does this weapon system is hopeless, or did this MI5 and MI6 uh, do X, Y, and Z? And mm. they will say, and they will say, um, um, they, they will say, we'll get back to you on that. We'll get back to you on that. And and then sometimes they've said they've leaked a, a related story, a different version, if you like, of your story mm. to another paper to squash your story. Yes, um, which is um, you know to put it mildly, pretty devious. Um, but if that, well, presumably the Guardian would, would the Guardian wouldn't have been very favoured anyway. Um, no, no, not really. I mean, that's why was, maybe the some of the Telegraph and any. But um, well, the, the Guardian, it, it they 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 can't really they don't really offer you stories which on their own bat. Mm. Um, I think they're they're wary. The Secret Intelligence Agency is wary uh, uh, of doing that. Of taking the initiative, what I think what they what they would do is is um, as I said earlier that they would they would they would they would um, they would dis distract you away from they encourage you not to pursue a story, and or they will say yes, there's something in that, but won't actually tell you what's in that. And I remember, for example, um, I think in one case when uh, there was a story that, that Manchester Police was saying. Uh, a, a bomb is going to blow up uh, Old Trafford. Mm. That claim. So I went to you know your sources and security intelligence agencies. Um, what is um, is is there any truth to that, or are the police exaggerating? Mm. And uh, the, the response was, "Don't pursue this story because it's exaggeration." I mean, not explicitly, but that, that's the sort of message. Mm. And and uh, you can say that to your editor. Say, look, my contacts and security intelligence agencies have told me that the police are exaggerating. So it's calmed down and all this kind of stuff, and they proved to be right in that case. And and I think they I think they probably will if they tell you if they tell you a porky, if they, they give you wrong guidance, mm. then you won't trust them again. So there is this element of is it cooperation, whatever you want to call it. Mm. But even skeptical journalists and the agencies, um, partly because also in this case, let's say. The papers did say that the, 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 the Manchester police uh, have, have said X, Y, and Z about this bomb in Old Trafford. And um, I mean, the, the, the spooks don't want that story either because it'll, it'll, it'll out because it'll be proved to be wrong. Mm -hmm. So in, any another claims by the police or anyone else, mm -hmm. people say, oh, this is just an exaggeration again. Mm -hmm. So it's not in the security intelligence agencies to encourage I mean, it's in their interest to suppress exaggerated stories, if you like. Mm -hmm. It's in their own interest. Yes. Because That's otherwise you get you get sort of empty stories all over the place and um, people don't know what to believe, you know. Yes. I think they call it, what do they call it? What, what the Russians, when the Russians do it, they call it the strategy of creating confusion or something. There's some kind of berserk oh. quote. Um, yeah. That, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's it. Um, so someone has written, how do you cultivate sources within workplaces and departments? Well, it takes time is the answer. Mm. And um, you, uh, let's say, on a it's easy for a specialist reporter, not a general reporter. Let's say um, you're writing about the police uh, and you, or you write about defense or indeed the security intelligence agencies. You get to know individuals mm. and everything, everything is based on trust really. Mm. Trust is important, and the one-to-one -one contact contacts. I mean, there have been occasionally um, you get a brown envelope mm. um, addressed to. Well, there's, a, there's a famous case when the Guardian was given a, a brown envelope from the Minister of Defence, Sarah Tisdall, who was a oh, yes. um, 
a foreign office clerk, clerk who who got papers on the um about uh Michael Hez well, Michael Hezai's plans kept under under wraps to um to uh, locate um, American cruise missiles in Molesworth and Greenham Common. Mm. Great story for the Guardian. We didn't know who it was. But there was a written lesson about that story. Peter Preston was then the editor. And the lesson was um, don't admit, you know, you say it's a pretty obvious lesson to learn. The Guardian rather reveled at the time in the fact we've got these wonderful documents saying mm. X, Y, and Z mm. by documents. And in fact, the, the following week, too, they said the same thing. So we, we, the Guardian, admitted it had the documents. Hmm. So the, the editor uh, was told by his lawyers, you've got the documents, you've got to give them back um, because the government knows that you've got them back. So in future, and of course we know what happened to her, hmm. uh, she was uh, charged on the Official Secrets Act and um, jailed for a few months. Now, the answer now, if you get documents, uh, you uh, reprint them, you retype them rather. Uh, or, or copy them out in longhand or whatever, because every photocopy machine now in Whitehall has a telltale mark somewhere, yeah, which the, the yeah. ordinary... Uh, Funnily enough, according to... Machine, uh, it came from which department's on, yeah. Uh, according to Sisman's biography of Lacari, the, the security services were doing that themselves in the 70s. They were retyping their own confidential stuff to make yeah, sure that... They were looking after the, uh, uh, a spy or something, yeah. Yeah, to make sure that no one would find their sources. So in some ways they were, they were, they were ahead of our... Yeah. They were ahead of our game. So yes, yeah, so so um, always retype everything that's in um, a doc. Yeah, yeah. What do you make of the Tisdall story, by the way? Because some people would say that Peter Creston, who was a very good editor and never really lived that down in some ways. I, I don't know. He, well, I think it's on his conscience and, and he made, I think the, the Guardian made mistakes. And one of them with hindsight, of course, they said that they sort of rather flaunted the fact they got these secret documents. Secondly, the legal advice was um, you've got to get them back, otherwise disobeying the law. The argument by Peter Preston at the time, and also others, uh, was that the Guardian had always said in his editorials, we obey the law. Mm. We can't obey the law. We can, we can, we can attack the law in, in opinion pieces and, and, and call for reform of the law, but you don't break the law. Um, now, I don't know whether, I, it's easy to say this, um, that the Guardian, the uh, the, uh, and the, um, the Guardian would have been, uh, the editor would have been in prison? No, he would have been a hero. Um, the, the threat that the, the government was then trying to push it down, that the Guardian, we, we would leak the Guardian, we would, we would, um, yes, uh, we would um, deprive the Guardian of you know, money. But, but just, to go, just to go back to the question, someone else has written about strategies that are more successful in extracting information from sources. Obviously, a healthy expense account works, but any, any other strategies for, um, Befriending and cultivating sources. Yeah, well, well, one thing the Guardian never did, and the papers do, of course, is pay money uh, to a source. Mm. Um, the, the strategy is basically, well, in, there's no point in 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 in, in talking to, to a brick wall eye someone who's, let's say, doesn't sympathise with your uh, what what you're gonna, you want to write about or your view of the world, um, or the current government, whatever it is. Um, you uh, the, the strategy is. So you're going to have long lunches, which uh, the days of long lunches are long since gone, actually. Sadly, yeah. um, but um, Chapman Pincher was a fantastic journalist, who people may know. Um, he uh, died not so long ago, at the age of 100. And he wrote about, um, and, and he had, he, he, I think, one of his chapters in his autobiography was called Long Lunches. Um, and, and, um, and, and actually, Chapman is quite a good example of how um, he, he was a he was a he was a conduit for for the Ministry of Defence, <laughs> but, but uh, and they would they would put stories into his uh, well give him stories, mm. which, which, which put put the Ministry of Defence in, in in a great light. They were paying for the lunch. But he didn't mind. He was he didn't mind. For example, he said um, I think it was time the nuclear um, nuclear test, the British nuclear test in the Pacific, thing. and. Um, um, he was told that the, the British government was going to delay the test hmm. because they're Japanese fishermen or whatever in the way. And of course, that was absolute, that was a lie. And um, and he was proud of it. He got proud of it. And, uh, I don't know if those, don't, those journalists don't exist anymore, but um, you've got to, um, uh, yeah, I think. Uh, Check uh, out who's paying for the lunch. You've got to, it's trusted. You've got to, and, but sometimes, after, if you're running for a long, long time, then someone in, in I mean, for example, invasion of Iraq. Mm -hmm. um, which is 
which is pretty, you know, hotly contested. In Whitehall, in, in almost the entire Whitehall, is that, uh, in, in half the Ministry of Defence and half the MI6, mm. uh, were against invading Iraq forces. The MI5 were very much against. We since we since know from uh, confirmed on the record by Eliza Manning and Burra, amongst others, they didn't have five at the time, that, that, that their advice was that it would encourage terrorism in Britain, and terrorism was the greatest threat in Britain. But um, I remember, you know, go kneel, or asking questions, I had one Christmas party at the, at the far off, as it was actually, um, at that Christmas of 2002, the invasion of Iraq was March 2003, going around all these people I sort of knew, um, or half knew, or knew a little bit, um, saying, uh, what about the invasion? What do you think? And you can tell by you know, body language, by no comment. And no comment is a confirmation often, you know. And anyway, you can you build up the story. I remember writing column after column, uh, putting the boot into um, invasion of Iraq. I know it's not on our subject of security intelligence, really, although mm. was dossier, the MI6 dossier became that. But, um, but the trouble didn't have the impact because no one resigned. Well, one person actually did resign, a lawyer in the Foreign Office before the invasion, and Robin Cook, of course, the Foreign Secretary, um, or rather the leader of the House of Commons then, but very few people in Whitehall resigned. They didn't want to be named, and, and a story which name um, officials, senior officials, is, is of course more effective than, than, than if you're relying on um, anonymous people. If you say, you know, MI6 is, is um, a lot of MI6 people were against the invasion. The entire of MI5 is you. You write that, and people can ignore that because uh, you, you're, you're not specific enough. You don't mention names. Hmm. How many of your stories? Did you have any stories that are, arose simply because you went to a party and someone let something slip? It seems to happen quite yeah. a lot. Well, one or, yes, yes, actually, one or two. Um, uh, sometimes I don't know whether these people know who they're talking to, i.e., me, and they know what line I take or the Guardian. I suppose most of my career. Um, do they know what they're doing? I think they, even under uh, you know the influence of a certain amount of alcohol, mm. I, I I think most of the people will maybe lo loosen their tongues a bit. But I I think they knew what they were doing. Exactly. Um, there's no one I, I can't remember who let slip something by accident, if you like, or my yeah, God, I made yeah. a mistake. Um, I didn't unfortunately have many of those <laughs> in my experience, but. But anyway, those kind of days in a way, you know, the, the, the boozy culture, the cocktail parties, the long lunches, it's all gone. And now you get sort of, um, you get people now say, uh, don't have a lunch, there's a coffee. Coffee is a thing, you know. Um, Not quite the same, is it? Early morning coffee or a mid morning coffee. Um, and, uh, and of course, you know, I, I'm sort of out of it now, but the, the, the kind of stories are different too, because maybe they're about, um, they're they're about uh, they're about they're about sort of tech techie spies and, uh, and I think but but you know there's, there's um what I mean by that is it's about you you got to know a certain amount of uh, detailed information more detailed information not about strategy and um, all that but about uh, what kind of detailed data programs and information uh, the spooks are getting up to and this the Snowden case was of course a yeah, the biggest, biggest, biggest one of all. Um, yeah. Let's talk a little bit about um, verbatim theatre. Um, I'm interested in your work in verbatim theatre because it seems to me in many ways to have been a precursor to all this very exciting sort of drama verite that's taken off in, in box set um, TV. Um, and you call it, I think, an extension of journalism in the same way that Adam Curtis defines his documentaries as extensions of of journalism. Can you talk a little bit about how difficult it is to build scenes out of masses of evidence at a public inquiry? Well, um, I suppose public inquiries where you know what, the, what, what happened because they're, they're early over. Well, actually, they weren't in all cases uh, that I did. And there's not much movement, either people, lawyers or people, officials in suits sitting on, uh, on chairs on the stage. So what is a dramatic, uh, there's not exactly great dramatic movement and so on, uh, mm. and surprises and all that. But, um, for example, if I put a um, bloody Sunday inquiry for 10 years into three hours, now you can do that. Why? Because if you're a journalist, one of the crafts, if you like, the, of uh, attributes, if you like, of, of, a, of a journalist writing about 
for, for a long time running about uh, aid, government agencies and so on. You read report and government activities generally, you read reports. Mm. You speed read, really. You speed read. And you pick up. I mean, it's like a court report. You see a court reporter. Uh, you know when the, 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 the barrister is about to come up with a kind of uh, quotable quote, you know. And you mm. see the journalists pick up their pens. That's what they're holding. And um, come to a soundbite. Yeah. Now, um, you get that. You, you, you get... Um, you know what you know what you're looking for, and it's just a question of speed reading and knowledge of verbiage, really, mm. uh, of documentation. Of, I mean, public inquiries. I suppose the biggest one we did was um, uh, Nick Kent and I, the, tri the then tricycle theatre in Kilburn, was the colour of justice. Mm. Um, and I remember um, well getting the transcripts and reading quite a few of them, uh, or pages and pages and pages of them printed um, anywhere you like on a bus, on a buses, on a beach, and, and you just edited them. Mm. Uh, maybe you marked them with a paper first. And then, but um, the, the other, uh, they started off because actually my, my, my first one was called the, the uh, play um, based on, by, based on a, a public inquiry, it was called Half the Picture, based on the Scott Armstrong rack inquiry, if you remember that, in mm. the nineties now. Um, I, I that, that came about because Nick Kent, who was then the uh, director, the artistic director of the tricycle, who I paid tennis with and others on every Sunday, said he'd been reading my stories on, mm. on, the, um, on this great scandal, really, the Scott Inquiry, and how these um, people from Matrix Church or uh, Coventry-based machine tool company had been uh, arrested and charged under the criminal law for exporting stuff, nuclear rated and weapons, uh, nuclear rated equipment, uh, uh, which could make weapons to Saddam Hussein. Um, but MI5 and MI6 sent them or encouraged them to go there so they could spy on Saddam Hussein and, and report back, which is, you know, that was, that was a scandal. Hmm. And the um, trial collapsed because Alan Clark, who was then uh, the, the, a trade minister, couldn't resist uh, saying that he, was in, he also encouraged these businessmen to sell all this stuff to Saddam Hussein, hmm. not to get intelligence, but just to, uh, to get... Um, money for the British Treasury. Uh, uh, anyway, so I, I, I got to write that that play um, because of Nick Kent saw the stuff and that was interesting. He said, let's put it up uh, to the theatre. I thought this was actually, this was, it's going to be hopeless. It's going to be, there's no drama, there's no movement, but I, I got to, pretty soon, I got to admire actors who translated this and they were quite, they became political. The, the actors, it politicized the actors too, in this case. Mm. And um, and they put it on, and it got tremendous uh, uh, um, reception. Actually, they struck chords. People, and that's the other thing about generally, and I think about the media, is that um, uh, news editors often and um, sometimes editors and senior journalists underestimate the with the knowledge that um, that the audience has, the readership or the listenership or the viewership, and the appetite for explanation. I mean, being, not knowing something doesn't mean to say you're stupid, you know, so they want to know, they, they've heard about the Stephen Lawrence case, but um, in, in maybe short stories or the odd clip on the BBC radio or whatever, but they don't really grasp what uh, story is about the explanation of it. Mm. If you put it on, into the, into the um, theatre, then you get the explanation, you get what it's all about. So there is an appetite for the serious, what now is called long form journalism, I suppose. And yes. we, put on, we put on a Nuremberg, which uh, by chance I knew someone who was um, a secondhand uh, bookseller who had all the Nuremberg trial uh, documents, official reports uh, published in 1946 and 1996, we put it on and that helped me. Uh, but you get, um, you, you choose your characters, you know, Goering, Rudolf Hess, whatever, whatever handful of characters, and then you get one or two touching moments uh, relating to detailed individuals. So the Bloody Sunday, we did the same thing. Um, so you, you get, a, it's kind of, I suppose, a kind of editorial art form, um, the craft you get to know. So in answer to your question, I mean, it, 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 um, um, it, it wasn't as, as, as difficult as maybe as it seemed when you get these mountains of millions of words. Mm. Um, you've got the confidence, you, you just, get at them and now of course but political theatre is now yeah much more common um is there, there's, uh, something, there's something promising happening because at the same time that there's the thinning of our attention span in clickbait people are ready for richer stories maybe through theatre 
or through yeah. the drama. That's something hopeful, isn't it? And a good way, perhaps, to invest. Yeah, it's near as treatment, near as treatment of of issue, not to over dramatized um, or, or uh, trivialized treatment. I think that's right. And um, that's happening. Is it happening in spite of because of social media? I think it made a bit of both. I mean, social media may be. Uh, 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 and, and tweets and so on may encourage people to pursue stories or know about or, 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 or as small aspects of stories which they want to pursue and get interested in. I think there's a thirst out there. The point is that there is a thirst out there mm. for serious coverage and analysis, if you like, and, uh, of, um, of, um, of, of, of what government and agencies and uh, big public companies are up to. I mean, this is not a sort of non, non the private private eye. The circulation is zooming up for the similar reason. Yeah. Do you think if you were starting out and leaving Oxford now that you would choose exactly the same uh, career progression as an investigative reporter, or do you think you might think about doing something a little bit different and more arty, which might um, win the same kind of attention in the long term? That's a good question. I don't know. It'd be difficult to. I don't know. I think. Um, I wouldn't to join the security intelligence services. I wouldn't have this, the, the new skill. I wouldn't be, you've got to, you know, know about computers um, and all that. But um, I think what was interesting, actually, I, got, I, I joined, or at least I was asked to join, for the thing, mm. um, tap on the shoulder and all that. Mm. And they encouraged me to you know, join another interview and all that stuff because I got a bad degree. I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have even had the, uh, my tutor wouldn't have said, why don't you try these people? You, you got a th you got a third. That's a recommendation, is it, amongst the higher well, level folks? I think it shows that you, you did something more interesting at university than just study books, which is which is the kind of intelligence, if you like, that the security intelligence services um, security intelligence, uh, wanted. Yes. And, um, I, I noticed that Nicholas Elliott, who was a good friend of Philby, yes, Tim Philby, who was indeed sent to. Get him, sent to get uh, him in Beirut, or was he sent to, or did he privately um, encourage Philby to say you're in trouble when you um, uh, get onto this Soviet freighter and go back, uh, go to Russia, which is actually what some people this is a conspiracy thing. Some mm -hmm. people um, think that um, uh, that's what M MI6 generally wanted because of the huge embarrassment it became known uh, uh, that Philby, you know, if he came back for either for a trial or or got immunity from prosecution and so on. Anyway, Nicholas Elliott, this friend of Philby, got a third. Hmm. He described it as a triumph over the examiners. And, and, and if he hadn't got a third, which is very difficult, by the way, to get a third, um, <laughs> he'd get a second card, I think. Um, the, <laughs> and, um, Douglas, a Douglas Heard, I think, as they used to call it. But um, um, anyway, one, one last question um, from Harriet here, who, who, may, who may or may not be a spook, but she's written, um, it would be great to hear about the changing ways in which foreign agents are active in the UK in the last 10 years. Get to know what they are doing. It, yes, the, the different ways in which foreign agents are active in the UK. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, of course they are. And uh, I think, you know, there's many, um, probably slightly more subtle uh, Russian ones and Chinese ones, um, but still being quite awkward. No, and they're after, they're are after different uh, bits of information, really. Mm. Um, and they made technology, for example, your Chinese students and all that. So, but um, yeah, and, and it's it's much it's much it's, in a way it's more difficult for MI5 to pursue all these uh, because there's so many potential you know spies of different degrees, students yeah. or, or and then the Russians are rather more subtle than they used to be. It's not difficult, um, but you know it's it's, it's and basically they're indirect. If they can get into some computer system from Mars, where they don't, they don't physically have to be in Britain, these. Mm. Right, if you like, and I think that the the, uh, the case in Salisbury. And I'm sorry, I forget his name now. What's his name? The guy who was poisoned. Who's oh, good poison, was good part, Was um, you know, you could say, why on earth did MI6 uh, 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 allow him to to sort of live op openly and almost sort of uh, um, well, advertise his uh, 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 um, his uh, you know his his house and this that, and the other. Anyway, that's a, that's another question. But it shows. I mean, where's the proof? Where's the evidence? There's a lip, lip, um, lip, um, lip tenko, There's one or two other people. Mm. Uh, poison. This and the other. I think the Russians probably will get slightly more subtle in future. And it's so easy to use cyberspace, for example, to spy. So in that sense, um, people are obviously trying to, you know, 
get hold of Western technology and so on, or have the ability to plan a potential disruption of some country's infrastructure and so on. Mm. That that is that is that is important. That is very very much important, rather than the old fashioned you know letterbox stuff and the Hampstead Heath and the stuff that John Le Carre used to write about. Um, so, so that, that is the that's the difficulty, and that's why they need ha uh, people who are geeks, people who know how to their way around the um, cyberspace. Yeah, I was, I, talking, I, was, I was talking to an investigative reporter recently, a former investigative reporter, and he said that the same kind of credulity that we used to show when confronted with a government document 40 years ago, we now exhibit when confronted with a document from an NGO or a think tank. I wonder whether there is increasing space for intelligence agencies, both our own and, and others, to use NGOs and think tanks as a sort of way yeah. of getting their message around. Well, so, so soft power type, more subtle type ways of doing it. Yes. I think the Chinese have been past masters of that too, and the, and the Russians sort of tried to in a rather sort of um, clumsy way. And yes. well, the, the Americans, Peace Corps, CIA, and all that stuff right. in, in, in the past as well. Yeah, I think there is. I mean, um, but the, uh, the uh, yeah, I don't know. It, um, it, it, uh, the NGA, I think the British Council was always often regarded in the past as being a cover. Um, but I think that is wrong, and it's been wrong ever since the Russians started Putin started accusing the British Council and other NGOs of being agents of Western propaganda, um, uh, or indeed spies. Um, so I think people are, are wary of that. I think there's a limit to uh, sort of NGOs, and, and the NGOs should be pretty much alert, much more alert now in the last few years than they were yeah. in the past, I think, about being used I mean, sometimes maybe they, they don't know, but I mean, uh, for sure, if someone wants to, they recruit is, 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 is an agent for uh, West or, 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 or a potentially hostile power, but I, I don't think so, no. I think that so, so, is not be yeah. So to come back to the question, if you were a Russian or Chinese um, officer, intelligence officer, looking for influence in London, where would you go? If I, if I was physically in London, hmm. who's in London? I wasn't in the internet or, you know, cyberspace. Mm -hmm. I was actually, I came to, where would I, if I wanted to do what? If I wanted to uh, uh, recruit. Uh, influence, recruit, intelligence gathering. Where would I go? Would you first thing, well, it's quite, I think that, well, um, there used to be, there must be, you would follow. Not so long ago, the, the MI6 uh, guy dropped his, left his behind a computer in a sort of come cafe quite near, uh, Vauxhall Cross, where they are. Um, do, you get to know where they're going. You follow these people mm. out of their offices. Thames House, in the case of mm. MI5 on Millbank. Mm. Sorry, I'm, I'm letting secrets now and giving some <laughs> advice. Or Vauxhall Cross. And you maybe you follow them. You follow them. Mm. See if these young people are going to some bar, mm. um, some hotel bar, some cafe, some. Uh, and then you do that. It, I mean, the point of pursuing the um, recruiting someone takes a tremendous amount of time. Yes, you've got to be really persistent. And you have to allow for a lot of failure before you get the, 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 yeah, the you get, in, you get knockbacks and stuff. Yeah. Anyway, let's not be advisors for the Russians or the Chinese. But thank you very much for all that, Richard Norton Taylor. Um, I'm very grateful to you. Um, can I recommend that everybody um, buys a copy of the State of Secrecy, which is distributed by Bloomsbury and available at all, all good online booksellers right now, so please do go and buy it. Um, thanks to Jake charles Reese, who's our producer in the House of the CIJ, who set all this up. And we're very grateful to you, Richard. So um, tune in next time for another um, CIJ online Logan talk. Thanks, Richard. Thanks a lot, Jim. Thank you. Cheers. Bye.